Okay. And we're going to have a uh, gallery view. And we are live. Hello to Lindsay Bonilla. Hello. <laughs> it's so wonderful to have you on the show. Well, thank so you so much. Excited. I'm so excited that you agreed to be interviewed. And uh, before we start, I, I should mention that this is the Children's Literature Channel of the Na New Books Network which I am fortunate to host. And I have a wonderful author today. And um, Lindsay, show everybody your wonderful new book. All right, this is The Note Who Faced the Music. I'm the author and Mark Hoffman is the illustrator. Okay, and I, and I tracked you down religiously. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and you somehow agreed to be on the show without knowing who I was and the uh, and very kind of you just to jump in. So so a few words about this book, which just came out a few weeks ago. Yes, it came out on March 14th. Um, and yeah, it's all about a little half note here and half note doesn't feel whole. And she just feels like she doesn't belong on the musical staff and she's not needed. So she decides to leave, but then she discovers that her friends do need her, so. <laughs> um, and. This is incredible. I mean, we had this little conversation because those of us who are trying to submit manuscripts on music and notes have all kinds of trouble because, you know, people tell us, oh, no, 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 we can't personify notes. It's very hard to uh, have a children's book about music, uh, yada, yada, yada. And you have done it. So chapeau to you. How did this happen? Start at the beginning, leave no notes out. <laughs> Give us the well, whole operetta. I'll tell you, yes. Yeah, so, um, well, the funny thing is I do not consider myself to be that musical. Um, the whole way that the book came about was one day out of the, just literally out of the blue, I just heard in my mind, you know, the words half note didn't feel whole. And what really drew me to it, the story was the, you know, the feeling of not being enough. That half note wished that she were more like whole notes, more, you know, bigger and beautiful or whatever. And so that was kind of like the, the little seed of the story that really attracted me to it. Um, and since I don't know that much about music, I really started, you know, researching and learning more about, you know, like I said, I don't think I could have maybe identified a half note before I started writing this. So I started, you know, trying to research more and learn more about notes and uh, music. Um, and then, you know, my my agent, she loves music. And so she was really behind the project. But when we started sending it out, we had people that were interested, but a lot of times the feedback that we would get would be, well, you know, kids, they're not, they can't even read, you know, they can't even read yet. So we're concerned about them trying to have a book that's about reading music. And we think it's going to be over their head or, you know, just it, it's, yeah, kind of aiming too high for the target age range of picture books. And well, my age and I didn't agree with that. <laughs> we felt like children are very bright. I mean, if I take my own children as my examples, they're constantly teaching me things. And I felt that that was really selling children short, that they wouldn't be able to understand the musical concepts, especially if they're reading it with an adult, you know, as picture books are meant to be read together. So I felt like with someone there reading alongside and learning together, that's kind of the idea behind a picture book, to learn something new. Um, so we just kept, you know, we kept going with it. And then another, you know, one of the um, rejections I got said that, oh, we love this story, but we don't know how you will, you know, illustrate these notes. And so again, everything that you're saying, we kept hearing, um, but we just kept going. Um, and I honestly, I'd kind of like given up on it. You know, it was still out there, I think, but it wasn't like one of the projects that I was following the most or waiting to hear back on because I felt like, well, people just don't get it. They're not, you know, they're not, they like it, but there's all these other things that they say can't be done with it. So I kind of wasn't really giving it much more thought when the offer came from Page Street. Um, and my editor, Kayla Tostovin, she was amazing. I mean, she just connected with the heart of the manuscript and the musical, you know, musicality of it. She was a musician herself and has always loved, you know, playing music. And it seemed like a lot of people at Page Street, the same thing. So they were excited about that part of it. And I was excited to find a publisher that was like, yes, we want children to, you know, see musical notes from a young age. So that's that's kind of how it came about. So, so those of us who are writing stories about notes are going to take notes. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm certainly going to take notes from you, and they won't be half notes. They will be full notes. So you're getting into the spirit of the puns in the book now, too. Oh, the, the, the book is punny and funny, and you're a terrific <laughs> author. Would you like to hold the book up and show sure. some of the, um, the illustrations and maybe sure. read a little bit of your funny, punny, sassy story? Sure. So you may start the beginning here and <laughs> Yeah, you, you get to pick wherever you like, Lindsay. Well, I'll start here and we'll just go in a little bit. Okay. Um, maybe half note, as you can see. Uh, half note didn't feel whole. She watched from the side of the staff as quarter note and eighth note jumped and jived to a toe tapping tempo. Music to my ears, applauded composer, but half note pouted. Why do they get to have all the fun? We'll be in the next piece, said Whole Note. I'm sure of it. But Half Note sighed. I hate having two beats. Why can't I be more like you? You're so confident. And you can fill a whole measure. Whole Note swelled proudly. I can't help but I'm so big and beautiful. Not everyone can have four whole beats like me. You're not helping, Whole Note, scolded Quarter Note, still bouncing as he returned from the rollicking riff. Composer says we're all important to the musical staff. If it makes you feel any better, Half Note, I'm only one beat, half your size. I'm even smaller than that, chimed in Eighth Note. Half Note's stem flopped. But you're so quick and upbeat, and you get a cute little flag. <laughs> it, it, it's wonderful. And, you know, maybe they... Uh, maybe the fact that you aren't a professional musician and you had this really um, fresh way of looking at the, at the terms of music, mm. which a musician like me doesn't have because I take all of these terms and words for granted. And then you come with a fresh look and you say, hmm, why do you call this a whole note? Why do you call it a half note? So, so for our um, uh, watchers and listeners uh, who aren't musicians, it's very simple. If there's four beats in a, in a bar, then a, uh, a whole note will take up the whole bar. Ah, half note will take up two uh, beats. Ah, a uh, quarter note. Ah, and a, a eighth note. Ah. And uh, you really don't have to know that much. And at the end of the book, you have this terrific glossary and back matter. Uh, yeah. And, okay. and I am uh, intensely jealous of you in a good way. Because if you can do it, then if if you as a half note can do it, then we other half notes can do it too. Yeah, and I love what you said that, you know, I think sometimes we're told like write what you know and that you shouldn't try to write something that you don't know. But yeah. if I did that, I would never have written this book. I would have said, I don't know enough about this. Now, granted, I did involve people in my life that are musical and said, you know, after I had a complete draft, I showed it to my husband who plays music and then I have a good friend who plays in the symphony and another who was a, um, you know, elementary music teacher. And I said, hey, I need you to look at this and make sure I haven't, you know, done anything that's not correct in the world of music. So that was kind of, um, you know, important to me to make sure that I did have people that were experts in the field looking at it as well. But yeah, I think it's perfectly fine to write something you don't know if you're willing to do the work. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. uh, let, let's, let's now go back. Um, yeah. You have um, a, a lovely book on penguins from about five years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you mention it? Maybe we'll come back to it. Sure. So I have Polar Bear Island. Um, and yeah, that was a, a very special book for me. It was inspired by my husband, who's from Colombia, and just ex inspired by an experience he had where he was treated differently because of his accent. Um, so while it's, you know, on the surface, it's a silly book about penguins and polar bears. It's to me, it's really a book about accepting people who are different. And um, you know. it's not it's not silly at all. <laughs> the, the, the penguin who comes over overseas, the newcomer is yeah. a bloody inventor. <laughs> right. He invents exactly. flipper flappers. Flipper slippers. And, yeah. <laughs> and then when the mayor finally gives in and his family can immigrate. Yes, yes. It's a book about immigration. It um, really is. Yes. Bring the family so and, and it's like a whole family of inventors, right? Right. Um, right. And uh, as somebody who immigrated, uh, I, I, I love it. And it's such a cute book. Was that your was that your first? 
Um, I had written a couple of books previous to that um, with a smaller like hybrid publisher, but I would say that was kind of my first big release, if you will. Um, okay. And I feel like it was kind of the first book I wrote where I really understood the picture book market, if that makes sense, because you know, makes a lot sense. of my earlier books, the word counts were way too high. And, you know, I was, I came from the world of storytelling. So in storytelling, you're doing, you know, all of the words are painting the pictures. In picture books, you're paring down the words so that the illustrator is taking an equal part of telling the story. So I really had to, you know, change kind of <laughs> change focus, if you will, to, to get that part of it. Um, so a lot of my earlier books, like, like I said, the word counts are really much higher than they needed to be. And um, so I, I feel like I learned a lot. <laughs> that was so th th this is this is an incredible. What, what I love about these interviews is sometimes you find these wonderful bits of pearls of mm. uh of experience um right. as, as i also published hybridly mm -hmm. and uh the, the you you've actually nailed it on the head when you're a hybrid author right and you're you're um paying for some of the publication costs mm -hmm. you want as many words of your own as you right you <laughs> want to be right you want to be in charge of the book right <laughs> you're paying you know i'm important and um and and then you end up with a with a text heavy, text heavy book. Mm, mm -hmm. Whereas when um, when you have a book coming out and there's a traditional publisher, they decide how many words are going to be in your book. And uh, my book that's coming out, they took out half of the words, and I said thank you. Right. Um, <laughs> so let, let's go. Let's go back now to Lindsay Bonilla as a uh, young girl. Sure. Your name was then? Uh, Lindsay Monahan. Okay, a good Jewish name. And uh, and you grew up where? I grew up in uh, Akron, Ohio. So not too far from where I live now, about half an hour away. And spent one year living in Wisconsin also, <laughs> Madison, Wisconsin. Yeah. And you, you wrote in your biography that as a young girl, you were like really rosy. Uh, <laughs> You, you put on plays on your front porch. Tell yes. us about that. So uh, I was an only child for the first 10 years of my life. And um, my parents had divorced. So for most, you know, until I was nine, I just lived with my mom and we moved around a lot. So I went to a lot of different schools, lived in a lot of different, you know, school districts and neighborhoods. And um, so the hardest thing, of course, you know, when you move is making friends. And I never really had kind of a solid base or I was always moving. As soon as I make a friend, I'd move somewhere else. So, you know, books and reading was, you know, one refuge that I had. Um, but the other was making up my own stories and acting them out and creating my own characters. So I would just start, you know, acting out something and pretending that the other characters were there responding to me. And I can distinctly remember being on my, we lived in a duplex with my grandmother for a while, being on her front porch and acting. And my mom was watching me and she was like, she thought I had a bunch of imaginary friends. So she was like, why don't you go in the backyard and do that? And I said, mom, I'm acting. And so uh, many years later, when I moved into the home where I'm living now, I was doing a rehearsal in my office and there was a window that faced, um, you know, towards the front of my home and the window was open. And when I'm practicing my storytelling programs, I do the same thing. I'm talking to myself, you know, imagining the audience is there, but practicing. And it was kind of this feeling of having come full circle, you know, that here I am doing what I used to do as a child. And, you know, and this is my livelihood, you know, telling okay, stories. So hold on, Lindsay. So one second. Yeah. So when you were on the porch or the stoop, uh, yeah. it was just you just with me, imaginary yeah. friends. Ah, so you you weren't like really Rosie who co-opts her friends into... Uh, into <laughs> no, no, uh, it was just me pretending that other actors were there. They weren't really imaginary friends. I was just imagining, well, that's where the other actor would be and there's where this actor would be and I would interact, you know. And, that, that, and that's how your storytelling career started. Yeah, yeah. In and I mean, incredible. I did this all through... I mean, even when I was in high school, I can still remember doing it to pass, like to make boring things, like make the time pass. So like I had the job of unloading the dishwasher because um, I had later had siblings who were 10 and 12 years younger than me. So I got the, you know, esteemed job of unloading and loading the dishwasher. So I would just like pretend I was, uh, you know, worked in a restaurant. I was the closer or something. And I would do that to pass the time. And so, you know, storytelling for me is just this, woven into my life okay but i i ask um, 
all the people I interview, you, you mentioned the word refuge, taking refuge. Mm -hmm. um, were you, uh, I, I, I believe that writers, they write to the, the, um, the age of their own personal angst or mm -hmm. frustration or happiness, some, some period of your life that you want to go back to for some reason or other. Mm -hmm. So is that your five-year-old? I, you know, I don't know. I would say I, I feel more like a, I feel more like a nine-year-old, a perpetual nine-year-old. <laughs> Maybe that's because that's like my happiest time where I was, you know, writing is the most and really finding my place on the stage and theater. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm you, so you, you are writing picture books for right. five-year-olds. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yep, I do. Right. Maybe as an older sister, maybe as a nine-year-old sister talking to the imaginary five-year-olds. Right. Yes. Yeah. I don't Interesting. know. Interesting. Interesting. So what did you, what did you study? Did you study literature? Or did, what did you study? So I was a theater major and a religion major at Northwestern in Evanston, Illinois. Yeah. Religion <laughs> and theater. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and storytelling. Yes, yeah, um, I, I fell upon that quite by accident, actually, because I loved a professor that I was taking a creative drama course with, and his name is Reeves Collins. He offered also a storytelling class, and to be honest, I wasn't that interested in storytelling, but I knew that anything he taught was going to be fantastic, so I took it, and of course, it changed the <laughs> trajectory of my life. So. You, you were, you're a born storyteller. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> you should you should be doing this show instead of me. No. <laughs> I have an idea. Okay, we'll talk later. Okay. <laughs> so, so um when did you when did you get the idea of becoming a uh, a picture book author? Yeah, that's a great question. Um so, you know, a lot of times when I go to school visits, I, people ask me, "Did you always want to be an author?" and I say, no, but I think because I never met one, my school never had an author visit. Any of the schools I went to, there, you know, never had an author visit. And I read, you know, constantly. I was always reading books, but I, and I was always writing my own things, but I never really put that together. It wasn't until I think I was about 25, 24, 25, and I had written, um, it was a story, and then I had turned it into like a dramatic sketch. And I said, I think this is a picture book. And that was, you know, kind of the, the beginning of me thinking, maybe I'm trying to write picture books. <laughs> so. Yes. And then what happened? Don't let me stop you here. No. So, yeah. So I just started, you know, taking it from that. But again, I, I think it was still the story and it what I hadn't made it into what I would consider a picture book format. I often think about that. Like I can take it back now and redo it <laughs> and pare it down so that, you know, the illustrations are doing some heavy lifting instead of me and all the words. Um, so, yeah, so that was kind of uh, kind of how I got started thinking about picture books was just because of that one particular idea. Yeah. And then what happened? So then I started, um, I just started looking for publishers that I thought would be, you know, interested in that kind of thing and looking up authors It just googling basically um and i found um i found some different authors that had published and said you know what's your experience been like and just tried to to learn a bit more about it and then that that story did end up being published um like yeah back in i don't even i can't remember <laughs> i can't remember years anymore everything is gone um but yeah, it did end up being published and I, you know, I, I got to share it uh, with the world a bit. And, um, but like I said, kind of always now knowing what I know, wishing that I had done things a bit differently with it. So, and, and, but so how did you, how did you get into hybrid publishing and then understand that perhaps there's a higher plateau yeah. of writing in the traditional world? I feel like in the beginning, um, you know, I think in the beginning, I just wanted to publish. I just wanted the book published. You know, that feeling of like... I, I, I like, live that feeling, dear. Yes. This is a good story and it should be published and I have to have it published. And, you know... And it's and a I great think, story and why isn't the world right, right. coming back to my door and exactly. banging, take me. <laughs> exactly. Agents are lining up. Right. So I was just, I think I just, you know... I did some research, but I didn't like I didn't know about a CBWI until many years later, which 
um, you know, obviously became very important too to me in publishing. Um, and so I think I was just, you know, dead set on having it published. And when I found that, oh, well, there was a publisher that might even have interest in it, it's like, I didn't think about any other possible ways, any other paths for it. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think that that's one of the things where, like I said, I think if I, my, <laughs> if my older self could talk to my younger self, I'd say like, take a deep breath, you know, <laughs> like, make sure first that you've found people to, you know, found a critique partner. I didn't have any critique partners at that time. It was me just, you know. What's, what's the critique partner? By the <laughs> way, we should mention SCBWI is Society of Children Book Writers and Illustrators, uh, by far the most important society for aspiring authors and illustrators. Definitely, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they were so instrumental to me. You know, they were instrumental in your new book. <laughs> instrumental, sorry, right? Sorry, uh, Lindsay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, that's terrible. <laughs> that's exactly it. I stole one of your puns. I'm sorry. When I try to think of the puns out of the blue, though, they don't come to me. That's what's funny. It's like I'm trying to think of them like, what would be a good pun? Oh, it's not coming to me <laughs> when I need it. Exactly. They always come when you don't need them. <laughs> um, so, okay. So um, you published some books uh, hybridly mm -hmm. uh, with, with probably with too much text um, mm -hmm. and not understanding that illustrators are not competitors for our stories. There are are wonderful partners. Definitely. Yeah. I think at that, I mean, to be honest with you, at that point, I haven't even thought about what contribution the illustrator, you know, I, I knew that the illustrator would do something, um, but I hadn't even thought about that or how that works. And I hadn't read, I hadn't read picture books. Here I was, you know, like I said, maybe 24, 25 years old. I don't know the last time I had read a picture book. So that became very important too, is having read and then, you know, now I have two children. So I started reading picture books with them. And that just changed everything. Seeing, you know, the picture books that I was reading when I was a kid are not the picture books that are being published today. Which were you reading when you were a kid? Just name one or two. Well, I mean, I love The Velveteen Rabbit. I can remember loving that book. Uh, I love Ferdinand as well. Um, you know, all which are heavier text, definitely. I mean, Ferdinand is, it's, you know, it's, um, I wouldn't say it's, hugely heavy on text, but definitely different than, you know, what's being published now, I would say. Those so, days are gone. And and when your kids were five, what did you read to them? When my kids were five? Uh, oh, well, I mean, at that point, we were going to the library and maxing out, you know, my, my library card. I mean, my husband who grew up in Columbia, he's not used to having so many books around. He didn't grow up with a lot of books in his home. And so he would just be looking around the house like, what is going on in here? It looks like an explosion, you know? And <laughs> so, I mean, and my my kids love stories. I mean, my my oldest, he, for his birthday, we just got him a new graphic novel, two graphic novels. And, you know, he literally like opened it right at the table after he opened it and started reading it. And then the next day was like, can I take this to school? And I'm like, as long as you get your work done. <laughs> Um, you know, so just growing up with that. Uh, there, there should be books, graphic novels for young kids with a hole. You can just stick a spoon through and feed them while they're reading. <laughs> but, yes. know, to, to, to promote, to promote uh, literacy among the young. Right, right. Yeah, so I mean, just trying to get everything new that I could, uh, you know, and read it and just, just seeing. Okay. Well, Lindsay, how did most authors... Mm -hmm. Some people are going to be angry with me when they listen to this, because um, as somebody who went this route mm -hmm. of self-publishing and hybrid publishing and publishing books where you have funding or partial funding um, mm -hmm. and not doing it right and not even knowing that you're not doing it right. But at some moment, like the moment for me was going to the SCPWI meeting in New York seven mm -hmm. years ago, was there a, was when I understood I was getting everything wrong, was there a moment for you? When you said, oh, my goodness, there's a better yeah. way to do this. You know, I can't I don't know if there was like one moment or just as I continued kind of soaking it in. But I remember that I had a book under contract with the hybrid publisher. And at this point, I had made this realization that in this one was even more text heavy than, you know, a previous one. And I and so I was getting, you know, I was getting it back and I was making suggestions. I was trying to make cuts that weren't necessary. And they were like, well, why are we, we're not cutting this now. And I was like, but it's going to make it better. 
And they were like, well, no, we're publishing it just as it is. And I was so frustrated because I thought, but it can be better. And I didn't feel the sense of yeah, let's make it better. I felt this. Well, let's just publish it because we've already that's we've already given you a contract that, for it. That's your moment, right? That's so I was moment. so frustrated, and and that was when I said, no, I've got to do it differently. Um, you know, and I think there are definitely people that are publishing, self-publishing. That you know, they have done this this work ahead of time. I had not, so I think that there are wonderful self-published books and hybrid books. Um, I'm just saying that I think I could have done better myself, you know, and known more to have made what I was putting out there even better quality. And some people have done that and still have chosen that that's the route that they want to go. And I think that, you know, that's fabulous. However, you want to do it as long as, like you said, you're knowing that you're putting out what is the best that you can do. And but you always have to start somewhere, too. So that's kind yeah. of me. You, know? you are a true Christian. Uh, so generous and so kind. Um, I'm Jewish. I I um, I now I, I wouldn't say I resent um, the self-publishing and hybrid publishing industry, but in a sense, uh, it does it trick people into thinking they're better than they are. And mm. I'm I'm saying this from my own point of view. Mm. Um, if if you know how to publish a book, then self-publish. But I've never met. I have never met a publish a picture book author who knows how to publish a book from a to z mm. and i know people are going to be angry with me and i i've self-published zillions and i have a website where people can self-publish and still um and not every traditionally published book is wonderful but they know how to make books better mm. than we do mm. your, your thoughts yeah i think that for me it's I love the collaboration. I love knowing that there's that many other people, you know, it's going through all this vetting, it's going through. Now that's not to say there aren't some books of mine that aren't out there yet that I'm like, man, like, you know, why can't somebody find this? Because it is, you know, it's so subjective in terms of even you get rejections that it's like, well, we already have this on our list or something somewhat similar that could compete. They're not even judging it on the basis of the work itself. So, you know, it has its place, but I, I can see what you are saying for sure you know the collaboration to me is is the best part of it and and just it's like all these different people working together it's like okay how can we make this better and then the editor and then the publisher and the art director and those you know we're just almost like these building blocks of um trying to make excellence you know and so i just i love that that piece of it i and love what you said different. trying to make excellence i love that so so how how did it happen for you how did you become one of the 1,000 or one of the 5,000 who found a, a great agent and, and uh, started succeeding with traditional houses? So um, I was, I think I was about, let's see, this was back, I think in October, it was in October, I was about six, five or six months pregnant with my second child. And I found out about this conference that was going to be happening in Michigan. It was SCBWI conference, or it was a retreat called the Knights of the Round Table. Um, and they were going to have um, published authors and um, editors. And you would kind of sit at a table with other aspiring authors. And, you know, at one session, it would be the author giving feedback. And the next session, the editor would be at your table and give feedback. And so I found out about this and I was like, oh, I'd really like to attend that. And I will say that one of my biggest goals was I really wanted to find an agent before my second son was born because I knew that it was just going to get crazy. <laughs> After that, I would have a three-year-old and a newborn. And I thought, I'm not going to have time to be in the query, you know, trenches <laughs> and sending out more queries and, um, and actually, to be honest, I'd had an agent previous to this who left agenting just kind of up and left. You <laughs> had an really, agent previous to this. I had an agent previous. So, you know, that feeling of, yes, I'm finally. So how, how did you agent. find your first agent? You're running ahead of us here. The in first what agent I found through 12 by 12. I was part of the okay. 12 by 12 writing community. So I mm -hmm. found her through um, one of their writing challenges. <clears throat> um, and so I was happy very happy and you know we were working together getting ready to go out and sub and then she just up and left the industry um and didn't really tell any of her clients she was leaving so we felt very ghosted <laughs> um and so you know managed to 
get out of that contract to find to start looking again. Um, and so I that was like my goal. I'd really like to find someone before my son is born. Just I'm not going to have time. So I decided to go to this conference. It was about eight hours away. And I thought, you know, maybe I'm crazy <laughs> making this drive here. But I found somebody else that would kind of we, I could meet up maybe about four hours in and we could share the rest of the ride. Um, so I did do that. And so I was sitting at the round table uh, with an agent from Sterling, now Union Square, uh, Brett Duquette, and he gave me some fantastic feedback on Polar Bear Island. And he said, send this to me, you know, make these changes and send this to me. And I was like, you know, you know, all those that feeling of like, should I be getting excited or not? <laughs> you know? So um, I came home, I made the changes, I sent it off to him. Within a couple of weeks, he said, I'm going to take this to my, you know, acquisitions meeting. And um, when it passed the acquisitions meeting, he said, now it has to go before the sales board. <laughs> so that's another thing. A lot of people don't realize there's all these, you know, <laughs> you get the yes from the editor, then you need the yes from all the editors, and then you need another yes from the salespeople. So, you know, I finally, I found out, I think it was right, it was right around Thanksgiving, I believe, that I found out, um, that I was going to have an offer on it. So I was ecstatic. And then at that point, I began reaching out to the agents that I had already sent Polar Bear Island to, to say, I have an offer of representation. And, um, and I think from that, I spoke with a couple of different ones and I had offers from two and decided to go with Krista, uh, uh, McIntosh, Krista Heschke at McIntosh and Otis. So. Now, but you realize how extremely talented and lucky you are because these agents, I, I keep saying this every week I say it and I can't help myself. They see thousands of manuscripts a year and they take a couple mm -hmm. of, uh, of authors. And you are one of these, one of these people. I'm, I'm, I'm so honored to speak to you. Oh, thank you. And how, what, do you, what do you think your magic dust is? <laughs> Uh, I don't, I think perseverance, you know, just keep persevering. And also, I mean, I, I, sometimes I wonder what if I never went to that? What if I never went to that retreat? Yeah, no, we both, we both agree that you have to have luck and fortune and meeting people. Yes. And, yes. and most of the people I've interviewed um, did not find an, an agent through the slush pile. Mm -hmm. They found yes. an agent at the conference, at mm -hmm. an opportunity to submit, uh, because how, how, how can you stand out among thousands of manuscripts? Yeah, it's so hard. It really is so hard. I mean, but on the other hand, you know, when you have the fortune to meet an editor um, right. and who likes your story, you have to have a great story. And Polar Bear Island is a great story. Well, thank you. So, um, so, and and you have, and tell tell us a little bit about your book that uh, that, that came out last year. I love yeah. you with all my hearts. Yes, I love what, you. What am I, an heart. octopus or something? <laughs> yes. Well, you know, you asked like, what is the kind of secret magic dust? And I will say also that for me, it's writing the things I'm most passionate about. Um, I think when I look at the stories that I've sold, they're the ones that have most the most of my heart in them. You know, um, the ones that haven't sold yet, a lot of them, they're you know, some of them are humorous, some of them are, but maybe the hundred percent of my heart isn't there in it as much, you know, I mean, I don't know. There's just certain things like this one, for example, I never set out to turn this into a book. This was a silly little thing that my kids and I used to do together. So uh, right after my youngest son was born, uh, his older brother, I would say funny things to him, like, I love you with all of my ears. And then I would take my ear and I would rub it on top of his head. And make him laugh and then I would say I love you with all my toes and I would tickle him with my toes and it was just this funny little thing that I did to let him know I loved him and every time he laughed it made me happy because I knew he was hearing it and he you know he would know how much his mom loved him so I was sitting there working on another um, picture book at a coffee shop when I just stopped and was like wait a minute maybe that thing that I do with my kids is a picture book and you know how now having the knowledge that I have of okay what's it going to look like visually and I said it's going to be really boring to look at with a mom on every page or a parent you know rubbing her ear 
and I said, what if I made animals as the characters? And then I can, you know, obviously amplify like animals with big ears and uh, animals with big noses or whatever it is. So, you know, this, I think literally the first one I ever said to my son was, I love you with all my ears. And that's the first, the first page here. And you can see the elephant and the fennec fox with their large ears. And so I just, you know, I started doing some research on different animals that had the characteristics I was looking for. But something funny, because we've already talked about the collaborative process and how much how important it is in, in this whole thing is um, when I wrote it, the very last spread, I did envision it as the mom with the child. I love you with all of my heart. Um, so the editor, after they had bought the manuscript, they came back to me and they said, how do you feel about changing that to have an octopus at the end to say, I love you with all of my heart since an octopus has three hearts? And I'm like, like brilliant, yes. So I can't even take cover for, you know, credit credit for the title, for the cover, for any of that. That was my editor, my publisher. So again, it just goes to show you why it's so wonderful to be with these creative people that are all thinking, how can we make this the best that it can be? Um, so again, you know, this was just, again, I felt like it was something silly, but really it's my whole heart of me telling my kids how much I love them. And it's amazing to think of other parents, you know, reading this to their kids so they know how much they love them. It makes me feel teary thinking about it. <laughs> wonderful. I'll have to pick that book up next time in the States. Uh, wonderful. And, and so we come back now to uh, your launch and uh, the reason we're here today celebrating. Um, can you show your new book again? Yes. The, the, <laughs> your, your noteworthy book. No to face the music. And I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that I pursued you uh, on the internet. Um, so, so here's the question. Yeah. Um, you talk about passion. You know, some people say, oh, write for the market. Find out, you know, uh, the, we're looking now for books on lampposts. So I'm going to write mm -hmm. a book on lampposts. But when you do that, your, 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 your hearts aren't in it, right? Right. So how, as someone who's not a musician, mm -hmm. How did you get your heart into this half note story? Yeah, I mean, to me, for me, the your, heart whole, story, your whole heart into the half note. <laughs> my whole heart was in this story because I think everybody wants to feel good enough. And so the, the, the you know, the first line, half note didn't feel whole. She didn't feel like she was enough. She, she wasn't as, you know, cool as the, you know, big whole note. She wasn't as quick and upbeat as them. And I think everyone is just looking to find their place and feel like they're important. So that was the like nugget of the story that was mo most important to me. And, you know, if I can hang all of the important musical terminology on that and make it fun, then great. But, you know, at the end of the day, then I want someone to read this book and say, hey, I have value and I matter and I don't need to be whole note and I don't need to be eighth note. I'm good enough as half note. And, you know, at the end of the book, it says, um, half note never did feel whole. She never felt like whole note, but that didn't, but she didn't mind. She was an instrumental part of the musical staff and no one could play her part like she could. And, and so that's and, to me. Yeah, the and note. the other thing, the other thing that I love about this is the quarter notes and the eighth notes. And they don't have a, they don't have a problem, mm -hmm. right? Right, right, they, right. They're fine being quarter notes and eighth, and eighth notes. And, and and that's what I love about this. And it's just a half note that has this, Terrible angst. I'm yeah. half. I'm not whole. Right, right. Um, I mean, isn't that like all of us like, oh, if only I could be more like this person, or if only I, I mean, and authors have that too. If only I could write more like this person, or no, write like you. That's the voice that the world needs, is your voice, yeah. not someone else's voice, you know? <laughs> so, so, yeah, but this goes back to something we just discussed. Um, and, 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 and that is writing for your passion, not for the market not mm -hmm. for what you think somebody else is going to buy. But right. you know, that isn't the way that, that we're taught sometimes to write. Mm -hmm. you know, a book should have this. And then I'm asked, uh, well, what about the story arc? Well, maybe I don't want such a strong story arc. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and books come out and sometimes they come out because an agent or an editor has said to themselves, this, this, this doesn't go against doesn't doesn't conform to the rules mm -hmm. but i still love it right right well exactly and i think and i think i think that you found uh by having a really great story and a great text and, and humor and passion 
Right. So you found the editor mm -hmm. who said, yeah. yes, this is quirky and it shouldn't work, but it will. Right, right. And I and I mean, that's my, I never write thinking about the market, if I'm honest. <laughs> I mean, I I write because the story matters to me and I, and I believe it's going to matter to someone else. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, obviously you're thinking, where will it fit? So, you know, you, that my mind goes there, but that's not my, my initial, when I'm sitting down to write something, I don't say, is this going to fit in the market before I start typing? <laughs> you know, yeah. I, 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 I better get a unicorn in here somewhere. <laughs> so, yeah. Hey, Lindsay, any, any, uh, any more tips for aspiring authors before we, uh, we start to conclude this wonderful interview. I mean, I would just say, yeah, keep keep persevering and write what what you write your heart. You know, literally write your heart out, <laughs> put it on the page for the reader. And I also like to say, I feel like for me, the best advice is in this business is you have to be have a hundred percent confidence and hundred percent humility. Um, so I go into everything believing this is publishable. You know, I'm writing this and it's publishable and I believe in it, but I also go in with humility, you know, with the people around me that are going to give me suggestions about how to make it better, how to, so, you know, sometimes I stand my ground when I feel that, you know, it's compromising the story, but I'm also open to the feedback and changing things and knowing that there are people that have this great experience that I'm still acquiring. <laughs> Wonderful. So this is a great time to thank you, Lindsay Bonilla for sharing this wisdom and your story. You're a wonderful storyteller. And I'm going to have to catch you on Zoom next week because maybe you should be replacing me here. No, we, no, we'll, no. We'll discuss it. Anyway, yeah. this has been wonderful, Lindsay. Congratulations on Thank your wonderful you know. new musical book. And uh, may it help uh, the wings of other aspiring authors who have musical texts that nobody believes in. So <laughs> Lindsay so. Bonilla, thank you very much. And I'm Mel Rosenberg the host of the Children's Literature Channel of the New Books Network, thanking everybody for tuning in. Have a wonderful day. Thanks so much. Thank you.